Hello and welcome to Heroic Media. I'm Patrick Cordova. And I'm Michelle Bauman. Here at Heroic Media, we explore news headlines that deal with very foundational moral issues relating to family, marriage, and life. Exactly. And those issues often revolve around abortion, euthanasia, embryonic stem cell research, human cloning, and homosexual marriage. Exactly. So what's our first story? Thanks, Patrick. First for today, the government of China has announced that it is ending its controversial one-child policy and replacing it with a two-child policy. Wow, how nice of them. How <laughs> generous. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess on one foot, it is kind of nice that they're easing things, obviously, because that will mean, I guess, you know, probably mean less abortions and horrible things happening. But at the same point, it's still very restrictive, and uh, it is just immoral, in my opinion. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the motivation for this is not that they've suddenly woken up and understood, you know, the concept of human rights. Yes. It's that they're having serious demographic issues. So right. since the 1970s, they've had this one-child policy, and now they have this aging population, and they don't have enough people, younger people, coming up to support them, the, both the social institutions and the economics of it. Just the, the society can't stay structured like that. Yep. And so they're saying, okay, well, now we're going to allow you to have two children, but it's still going to be strictly enforced. So they have forced sterilizations, forced abortions. You hear some really horrible stories coming out of China, and um, and I don't think that's going to change. Yeah, and that's, I think, the whole point is even though they've, you know, eased this a little bit, it's not going to change. And mm -hmm. like you said, it's kind of for selfish reasons, you know. We, we always want to control, it seems like, our everything about everything in our lives, you know. We as just society today around the globe, and in, in China, it's no exception. But, you know, we want to control you know, exactly what we're going to get, when we're going to get it, how we're going to get it, you know, and that's the same thing with them. You know, they're trying to control this population to such an extent that they're, you know, going to these extreme measures where they're, you know, forcing people to have abortions mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and there's all kinds of other bad things that happen to a, so a society when these types of laws are put in place. You know, I know China has a lot of trouble with uh, suicide rates. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and I think that that is directly related to a lot of these policies and the mentality um, that, you know, kind of gets adopted by society. You know, and it might be something that, you know, somebody wants to adopt um, or maybe something forced upon them. But either way, I absolutely. think it has a negative effect. Mm -hmm. on society itself. Right. So, uh, you know, you brought up the suicide issue. I think that's really important. One in four suicides in the world happens in China. Wow. And women are 25% more likely to commit suicide in China than men are. Hmm. And so some of the women's rights activists are saying this is actually playing a huge role, this one-child policy, because you have these women who are going through these horrible forced abortions. They're strapped down to a table. You know, they're, they're forcibly they have an abortion and then they're forcibly sterilized and they go through essentially post-traumatic stress disorder, all of these different kinds of traumatic things. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually heard some, some testimonies of women in Congress saying, yes, I had suicidal thoughts or I tried to commit suicide after this. I was so devastated. Wow. So it's really harming women. Um, and it's, it's, you know, we see this, this loosening, but I don't think it's, it's fundamentally solving the problem because it's still so coercive. Um, a little bit yes. of background on this policy. So it's been in, the, well, the one-child policy was started in the 70s, mm -hmm. and it's estimated to have prevented up to 400 million births. Wow. And so what that's done is really skew the gender ratio yes. because there's a strong mm -hmm. male preference in China. Right. The, the male can carry on the family name, the family business, the family farm. And so if you're only allowed to have one child and you find out that you're going to have a girl, they oftentimes abandon the child. Infanticide is very high there. Yep. They abort the child. So now you have a lot more men than women, and that's causing human trafficking, just a whole bunch of problems. It's yeah. really snowballing it, it, that, in, in the problems that it's causing. Exactly. I think that's a good point you said, you know, that it's snowballing because I don't know that they, you know, when, when the government thought about it, that they really first, you know, had the forethought, I guess, or saw that these types of things would happen. But you can see kind of how they're connected and how one thing leads to another. And like you said, it really what it comes down to is it hurts the women. Right. And so um, I'm always curious to see, because you, know, you don't really see much about this type of topic here in the U.S., mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me like if I was with a feminist organization, and I'm not talking about like authentic feminism, but you know, the, the feminists that we see so often here in America, that they would be outraged by this and you know, having mm -hmm. protests and trying to create all kinds of things to change. Because that, I mean, really, those 400 million uh, lives that were uh, killed as a result of these laws since the 70s, um, I mean, you would you would think that a lot of those, more than half, I, I would assume, 
were were probably uh, female, right? Right, absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 very dangerous to be an unborn baby girl in China right now. Right. And um, you know, we'll see with being allowed to have two children if that makes a difference or not. Um, but there's still going to be you know these forced abortions and sterilizations. Now, if any of our viewers are thinking, hey, I thought I heard that this policy was already lifted a couple of years ago. Just to clarify, in 2013, mm -hmm. China slightly expanded the policy, and they said, okay, well, if you um, if there's a couple where one of the people involved is an only child, then you can have two children. Yes. So they had already at that point said, oh my gosh, our demographics are really going to fail here. Yes. What are we going to do? And, they, and so it's interesting to see this trend. They're opening the door wider and wider, and we'll see if eventually they go on to open it, you know, even more. Right. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, there's there's a lot of damage that's being done that would have to be undone. And some, you know, there are some people in China who would say, well, why would we want a second child? They've had 40 years of being told one child is the correct number to have. And mm. so socially they have to have people, you know, right. teach people actually, like, it's kind of nice to have a brother, exactly. a sister, an aunt, an uncle, because those things are, are non-existent. You wonder if you'll get to a point of no return, right? right. Where it will change the culture so drastically mm -hmm. that, who knows, maybe it'll implode by itself as a result of this, right. something that they didn't didn't see coming, right. you know? Right. It'll be really interesting to see how things turn out, but um, yeah, for the meantime, it, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, a step in the right direction in some ways, and in other ways it's still Not the same enough. thing. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, what's next? Okay, in our next story, the latest in a series of undercover videos on Planned Parenthood shows an abortion doctor appearing to admit to performing illegal partial birth abortions. Wow. These, these videos are disturbing. You know, every time you see a, another one of these videos, um, and uh, I know, you know some of these videos were released, um, you know, I, I guess they weren't supposed to be released, but they were released. Somehow they were leaked in, in their entirety, some of them uh, that had previously not been released. So it was really interesting um, watching some of these, and, and I didn't watch all of them, but seeing, you know, what, what came about, you know, more details to these. I, I just think it's really clear um, when you when you watch these videos of what's going on right mm -hmm. and and it just it's annoying to me when when people who are trying to support Planned Parenthood are like well you can't even take these videos into account because the organization that was trying to you know oust Planned Parenthood um, you know they they were doing something illegal themselves or you know they try to like hide behind some sort of like smoke screen that's just like you know no these the, you know we have to disregard everything because of the way that they expose them and it's just kind of ridiculous because like well no it still shows that they did something you know regardless of right. their tactic and they kind of had to do that in order to get things um, uncovered you know what I mean they had to pretend that they were an organization trying to purchase tissue from aborted um, a, mm -hmm. aborted babies mm -hmm. um, but yeah it does it, it exposes the, the practices that um, that plan what it exposes what Planned Parenthood is doing you know and I think it's it's, uh, as you know nobody went in there with a video camera and showed them actually doing these things right um, but I think it's pretty clear by their testimony that they do these things. right right and so the doctor is describing this abortion procedure yeah. and based on what she's describing it's pretty graphic right the the organization that's putting out this video is saying she's describing a partial birth abortion right part of the birth abortion is where they it's a late-term abortion where they allow the woman to go into labor mm -hmm. or they give her drugs to put her into labor and then they deliver the baby most of the way and then um and then they kill the baby right and that's it's illegal right um and it's something that is is a very serious matter legally um and that the the people presenting this video are saying well that's exactly what they're describing here and laughing about it talking about it very casually oh yeah and I think we've seen this in a variety of different of these different videos, the various different things, talking about selling different body parts, laughing casually about oh, a lung, a heart, how mm -hmm. much they're worth, accepting money for them. They've talked in previous videos about altering an abortion procedure so that they can get the good tissue, which is also illegal because that can affect the safety of the the woman. You know, right. that's that's not good for the woman. And so Planned Parenthood has denied all of this. They said, oh, no, no, we haven't done anything illegal. We've just been donating the tissue for, you know, just a, a reimbursement that just covers our costs. They've recently announced that they will not be accepting any money for these donations because there's been so much controversy surrounding this, a right. congressional investigation. So I think we just, you know, more and more unfolding, more and more illegal activity. It's almost not even shocking anymore because we've seen so much of this come out of Planned Parenthood. It's you really just see a depraved organization, right? And I think that's what you see. It's almost not shocking anymore, especially for them because they're so they see it all the time, mm -hmm. right? It's it's become like so commonplace that they can just sit there and joke about it. Right. And deep down inside, I think that they do joke about it because they know deep down inside that there is a baby there and it's difficult. I think sometimes people make jokes about situations that are difficult in mm -hmm. order to make things easier for themselves. 
I don't know if that's the case with these or all these people or not, but I know that certain people in my life that have mm -hmm. had experienced bad things in their life working in difficult lines of work, mm -hmm. that's what they do to kind of cope with things. Right, And absolutely. I almost see that in, in this case as well. Yeah, and particularly with something like a partial birth abortion where it's such a late term baby, that it, you can tell it's a baby. It looks mm -hmm. just like a, a little premature baby. There's no question. It's very clearly identifiable as a baby. You're delivering this baby. The woman is giving birth. You can't deny that. At a certain point, you have to, you know, kind of force yourself to, to be delusional if you're going to be denying that. And maybe the humor is part of that, like you're suggesting. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we'll see. I'm sure there'll be more videos mm -hmm. and more discussion about this in the future. Absolutely. Coming up after the break, we'll see what one popular TV show has to say about Dr. Ben Carson's views on abortion. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Heroic Media. In case you're just joining us, I'm Michelle Bauman. And I'm Patrick Cordova. In our next story, the hosts of The View have called Dr. Ben Carson's views on abortion despicable and pathetic. So, pretty harsh words, Very right? Very harsh words. Do you want to give a little bit of background for our viewers? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So, um, so Dr. Ben Carson, so first of all, I want to take a step back because we had a show, I don't know, maybe about a month or so ago, um, where we uh, referred to Dr. Ben Carson's views on abortion. So he had said some things that were a little bit confusing, and I want to read what he had to say initially about this. Um, and so this is specifically in relation to cases of rape and incest. So he said, well, in cases of rape and incest, I would hope that they would very quickly avail themselves of emergency room, Carson replied. And in the emergency room, they have the ability to administer, you know, are you 46, other possibilities before you have a developing fetus. So this, in this interview, uh, Cavuto said, uh, well, that is at the point of conception. Do you see that as a life, doctor? And uh, Dr. Ben Carson said, certainly. Once the heart starts beating, certainly at that point, said Carson. And so if we are willing to open, uh, open up the discussion, both sides, um, I think we can come down to an accommodation. So basically, he seemed to be saying, you know, in cases of rape and incest, it was okay to take the morning after pill, the RU486. So it was a little bit confusing because, you know, he was at that point, uh, you know, uh, certainly considered pro-life, uh, but then his views regarding rape and incest seemed to be like, okay, he's okay, he's one of the people that is pro-life, but then says, except for in cases of rape and incest. And so after that, he, so at that point, you know, we had had a discussion about, and I had just mentioned something about his views. And so at that point, it seemed as if he, he, he was, he fell into that category. So he later went on to clarify um, his views. And um, after clarifying his, his, his views, and so he was interviewed by uh, Meet the Press. And so you can go look at the video of him uh, being interviewed. And he clearly, uh, and there says, yep, I want to overturn Roe versus Wade um, in cases of rape and incest. He's not in favor of killing a baby. Um, and basically, he just, pre you know, he kind of really changed, especially on the, the uh, rape and incest. But he was very clear, very to the point, and, and he is certainly 100% pro-life, it would seem. And so, uh, basically on The View, they had their reactions to this video. And so what was your reaction to their reactions? <laughs> well, I think my reaction to their reactions was to, to just look at Ben Carson and say, okay, well, he's trying to clarify here. And they're just absolutely intolerant of any kind of pro-life view. And it's just, nope, you're not allowed to be pro-life. This is not acceptable. And the way that they describe just the, the, the really charged language that they use to describe his view, it's just, you see the intolerance. Mm -hmm. of the pro-abortion movement. And, you know, I think it's really important that we as Catholics explain our views well, because I think this particular issue, the rape and incest issue, is very difficult it for a lot difficult. of people. Yeah. And it's understandable because you have you have someone who has been harmed very much and an yep. act of violence has been committed against a woman. And we have to be clear that she is a victim here and that there, yep. sh she has dignity and that that something horrible has happened to her. We can never undermine that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have to realize that killing an innocent child doesn't undo the harm that has been done to her. Yes. And that's, that's the view on it. Now, uh, there's actually a lot of politicians who have done things like Ben Carson, a lot of pro-life politicians, mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of Republicans, a number of the, actually the candidates running 
in the GOP this year have made similar statements where they've said they're pro-life, they want to defund Planned Parenthood, they want to do all these things, but then they'll be questioned about it and they'll say, oh, well, in cases of rape and incest, I think it's fine to take the morning after pill to take, you know, these, these abortion drugs. Right. And then oftentimes they end up coming out clarifying later. I think that people don't understand this issue or they get caught off guard and they're not sure how to answer. Yeah. They don't want to sound like they're not compassionate. Maybe they haven't thought it through. Maybe they don't realize that these abortion drugs are actually causing abortion. Yes. Because you're taking a pill and it's so early on in the pregnancy, it doesn't seem like an abortion. Absolutely. But I think, I think the bottom line for us as Catholics is that we need to know how to understand our views on this and how to explain it clearly and with compassion. Yes, I think, you, man, you summarized that <laughs> perfectly. And I think that that's the case and I can kind of relate and I don't know if that was the case for Dr. Ben Carson specifically him maybe not mm -hmm. have have having thought through it or knowing that there there was you know a, a, a human life being uh, you know could, that could potentially be killed and, and everything in those in those cases that he mentioned previously um, but I know I can relate because you know at one point in time I was like that you know I was certainly would call myself pro-life, but I hadn't really thought through all of the kind of mm -hmm. details of the different kinds of drugs and procedures and things and how that would relate to um, where life begins. Right. And so I can totally relate to, to, to if, if that was the case for mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're right, absolutely. And but, but I think as Catholics, just like you said, once we sit down, we look at it, we think about it, and I think it, it becomes very clear. And I think the same would be for the case of the people on The View. If you actually went down in there and actually got into the tough questions instead of just sitting on the surface of things and kind of not really thinking about thinking about things and getting into it, I think that they would also come, I feel, I would hope that they would come to the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, you know, it, it is. It's a, it's a different, it, it's a very difficult uh, conversation. Right. Because it's a, t it's a tough topic to begin with. Absolutely. Rape and incest. So, Absolutely. Yeah. The controversial euthanasia advocate, Dr. Philip Nietzsche, can no longer promote voluntary euthanasia after the Medical Board of Australia has imposed strict regulations. So, uh, basically, this uh, this person he he he's, he lives in Australia. He's mm -hmm. very uh, well known there. Not so much, I guess, in the United States, um, but he promotes um, uh, voluntary euthanasia, and so he's he's very well known um, and. He's been investigated, actually, for quite some time, for the past few mm -hmm. years. There's been an ongoing investigation, and basically what they've been investigating him about um, was related to all this euthanasia. Right? right. And so there's been allegations that he, for instance, you know, there are people that have seen him that are otherwise in good health, but they really, they're just depressed. Mm -hmm. And basically, he's gone in and said, you know, oh, he, he, he hasn't really done, in my opinion, he hasn't really done his job as a doctor to try to help this person out. And pretty much he's just trying to, it seems to me like they think and other people think that he is just going in there and saying, hey, you're in a tough situation, you're having some problem with your health, maybe it's mental health, maybe it's not, you just need to kill yourself, basically. Mm -hmm. And then he helps these people. Um, do that, carry that right, out. Right. And so the board has been investigating him and um, the Medical Board of Australia. And so they finally said, okay, listen, first they pulled his license last year, then this year they reinstated it. And then shortly after that, when they reinstated it, basically as a part of, of that license, his, his license to practice medicine, they said, yes, you can practice medicine, but here are 25 restrictions mm -hmm. for you. And they were pretty harsh. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it was very, it's definitely certainly in stark contrast to what's happened here in the United States in a few states right. uh, with the legalization of, of euthanasia. But they basically said, listen, man, you cannot talk about anything mm -hmm. related to euthanasia. In, like even to the extent that um, you know he's read or he's written books and he has to take his names off of those books. If somebody comes in wanting euthanasia to him, he has to refer them to to somebody else like, to to a mental health specialist, to a, yes, not to someone to else who's going to kill them, but to right. someone else who's going to help them. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So I mean, it, it, it is, it's it's pretty interesting. Pretty right. Interesting yeah. Case. And he has to be he has to practice with indirect supervision for two right. years. He has to be supervised. Yeah. And he's not even allowed to prescribe the the drugs that he was giving people yes. to to kill themselves, even if they have some other reason. So they're really limiting what what he's allowed to do yeah. now. And he's agreed to those conditions, yeah. but. Um, he's he's a big suicide promoter internationally, and he and his wife both. Um, and so it's you know in the initial cases that they were investigating him for, you had mm -hmm. at least one individual who was healthy, who was young, mid forties, but who was simply depressed, and he allegedly counseled this person. Right. Oh well, you should kill yourself. Exactly. And that's illegal in Australia, and and Australia just said no, we're not going to accept this. And I think if we really look at our views, it's really inconsistent to say on one hand like I. 
I support I support assisted suicide, but mm -hmm. I oppose depressed people killing themselves. And we look at, mm -hmm. you know, we, we recently passed the one-year anniversary of Robin Williams' death, and everyone right. mourned that. That was tragic. Yeah. And we look at, you know, there's an effort to try to, to prevent suicide among mm -hmm. depressed individuals, and that's good. That's as it should be. It is, yeah. But we can't then say, oh, but sometimes it's okay to help them kill themselves. Right. That's, that's absolutely incoherent. So we'll see what happens. This doctor has agreed to these conditions, but he's also suggested that if it gets in his way of... of practice too much, he might turn and focus on his comedy career. I thought that was He recently performed in a show about death and euthanasia. So this guy is obsessed with this. Seriously. He said, I might just go into comedy and do euthanasia comedies. Yeah. Still in euthanasia, just a little slightly different. So we'll different. see comedian. what he ends up doing. Yeah, a comedian. I thought that was really interesting as well. And it seemed like he really kind of almost gave up on on this whole battle or whatever about his ability to practice because he said, I have agreed to these conditions being imposed in order to put an end to this matter with the medical board. So it pretty much sounds like he just wants to be over with it. And then if he finds that it's too much of a pain in the butt, then he's just going to be like, okay, I'm going to go be a comedian because mm -hmm. I guess he had one show already and it went really well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess euthanasia humor is just hilarious. Yeah. Pr pretty interesting. But I think this is important to note the story because this is where things can go, right? And you, just mm -hmm. like you said, you get on this slippery slope. Right, so, absolutely, absolutely. Yep. So we'll see how this goes in Australia. Yep, exactly. All right, stay tuned. We have one more story coming up after the break. Welcome back to Heroic Media. In our final story, Heroic Media News Director Jenny Eubing offers suggestions to combat what she describes as the often lonely vocation of modern marriage. The lonely vocation of modern marriage. So why was it that it's lonely? Yeah, interesting question. Yeah. So her suggestion is that in marriage, the couples, you know, you, you, you get engaged, you get married, and then you're just kind of on your own. Mm -hmm. And there's some, some prep, some marriage prep in the church. And then after that, when you're actually trying to live it out, it's like, oh my gosh, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so she's saying, hey, well, let's look at better marriage prep beforehand and then better accompaniment of the married couple afterwards. So she calls it a marriage catechumenate. And she says, hey, if you're going to go into the priesthood, you spent eight years studying for it. Mm -hmm. If you're going to get married in the church, you have a couple meetings with a priest, maybe an NFP class. <laughs> you know, it's not a whole lot. It right. kind of differs from diocese to diocese, but it's not a whole lot. And she said, you know, if most people are getting married and we're calling people to live marriage in such a radical countercultural way that's so different from, from how the culture views it, we have to give them the resources and the support to be able to do that. Yeah, I think that's a very, very good point. And I, I agree with her. I think having those resources is extremely mm -hmm. helpful. I found marriage preparation class, like when I took it, I don't know how many years ago, <laughs> 10 years ago, 12 years ago, whenever we took it, um, it, was, it was very helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think that in marriages that every marriage is going to have some sort of trouble absolutely in it, right it's just a part of being human and especially when you're in a marriage with another person but um, I think that uh, you can avoid a lot of problems in your marriage if you talk about all these important things mm -hmm. and you really know you're both on the same page about what you're expecting from marriage and what marriage is about and um, and and I've just found that really helpful and I've seen that in other marriages like friends of ours um, uh, that are married that, you know, you, you, you're just shocked that things come up in their marriage that they haven't talked about. Right. And you're like, that seems, like some, sometimes people don't even talk about children right. before they get married, right. which is just amazing to me. I guess some people, you know, one person is thinking, oh yeah, I'm, uh, oh yeah, well, oh, there's no chance. You know, I'm definitely going to have kids. You know, and the other person's going, oh, there's no way we would have kids, right? And right. they never had talked about right. that. Right, they assume they're on the same they page. They assume they're on the same page. So I think it's really important to, even if you do think that you're on the same page, to really discuss things, vet mm -hmm. them out, and talk about them. Because, I mean, those types of things are so huge and critical. That could really destroy Absolutely. a marriage. Yeah, yeah. And that's why the church in the U.S., they have a, a really long survey that they have you fill out that's mm -hmm. actually saying, you know, where do you stand on these issues to make sure that you've talked about them. And there's right. going to be some areas where you don't agree. Yep. But to at least know, okay, we've had discussions on these. We've come to an agreement. And so, you know, Jenny's suggesting that's a great, and that's already a lot more than you get when you just get married, you know, in a courthouse. But then what happens after that? But let's do some more. Yeah. So a couple of her practical suggestions. She said, what about 
having a mentor couple for the first few years mm -hmm. because most of the marriage prep is, happens before the marriage. You're right. working with a priest. And she said, well, how about once you get into it, somebody that you can talk about finances with, just some of these, these frank discussions, kids, all these things. Once you're living it out, you might have more questions that you didn't have you know, beforehand. Absolutely. She also suggests annual retreats for married couples with opportunities for spiritual growth, reflection, and fellowship. And then she suggests small groups at the parish that get together to do things like dinners yes. and Bible studies. I know some parishes actually have these things. I know some retreats like that do exist. Yep. So yep. In, in some respect, these things exist. But she's Absolutely. saying, hey, let's expand on that. Let's grow. Let's build. We yep. just had the synod on the family. Let's look at what we can do to help families, to help marriages to succeed. Absolutely. And I found them very helpful. I know at the parish that I go to, they didn't have those things at mm -hmm. first. And in the past about four years or so, those things have come about. And I found them to be really helpful. And I mm -hmm. think that having, you know, examples examples of other couples and what they're going through and you know obviously developing friendships but, right. but but having those other couples that are in a community that are catholic that you know have the same types of values and morals and principles and are striving for the same types of things that you are really helps especially when you're in a setting where you're uh, you know being guided by some sort of spiritual advisor like a priest or somebody in the religious community um, that can really that maybe has had that experience helping couples like that uh, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, right, it's, it's super helpful to have that. You know, the marriage prep is kind of like that foundation. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you have somebody help you build that foundation and get everything straight, and then you're just kind of on your own to build the rest of the house, I mean, that's asking a lot. It can be very difficult. And, you know, people do get through it. But I think that, uh, you know, having that extra help and those extra classes and, and all those resources that you just mentioned totally will help people out and help them continue to carry out their vocation of marriage as, as God intended. Right. Absolutely. And I think the encouraging thing is that we're starting to see this more and more. We're starting to see it at the diocesan level, at the parish level. We're starting to see other organizations coming in and saying, hey, you know, the divorce rate is pretty high even among Catholics. What can we do? Let's provide these resources. Yep. So I think we see some encouraging signs that these things are Absolutely. being developed. Absolutely. Step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. All right. That's it for this week on Heroic Media. Please join us next week for all the up-to-date news on the pro-life issues that matter to you. Please feel free to write to us with any comments, questions, or news tips at news at heroicmedia.org. And please check out our website at heroicmedianews.org where you can view more stories like the ones we discussed on this episode. That's it for this week. Until next time, keep us in your prayers. God bless.